Join Justin Townsend and the Harvesting Nature crew as they explore the world of cooking wild fish and game while sharing recipes, tips, tricks, and lessons learned from their pursuit of wild food. We sure hope you ate before the show, because you're going to leave hungry. This is the Wild Fish and Game Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to Harvesting Nature's Wild Fish and Game Podcast. You got your host here, Justin Townsend, and uh, we've got another special guest uh, today. Very special guest. We're going to talk about a lot of a lot of cooking uh, over in the Lone Star State, cooking and eating and hunting. Uh, so excited for all those things. First off, we'll get uh, some updates out of the way and uh, some of our, our more common uh, news stuff so you can catch up on what's going on in, in the world over at Harvesting Nature. So uh, for me, since the last podcast, been out in the Cherokee Woods uh, recording this in, in the springtime. So uh, we'll, we'll see. Not sure when we're going to release it yet, but it'll be out at some point, which you will hear. Uh, no luck yet. Uh, going back out again for turkeys next week. Try to bag an Osceola before I get out of here uh, and move on. To the wild wild west but uh let's see colin what uh what updates you got going on in your neck of the woods uh not a whole lot there's no real seasons going on right now and there's the typical small game or i guess un non-season critters you can go after but uh i think i'm gonna let the one ground squirrel that visits my backyard let him go this time around uh, <laughs> it's a california ground squirrel which i hadn't seen here before it's got little spots on the back kind of neat uh, but other than that, I'm just preparing for the uh, bear and turkey season coming up because uh, we got our hunt in about a month. And I've been going on some hikes, looking for sheds and mushrooms. I think it's a little bit early for mushrooms still. Uh, I think I heard about right around the dandelions come out is when morel season comes around too, a couple weeks after. So we don't have any dandelions yet. That's going to be my benchmark for looking for them. And uh, I, think I think it's a... Uh, I think they're creeping up your way, though. I just saw uh, my cousin in Oklahoma was posting. They were finding them out uh, out in the woods there. So, Oh, good. Uh, yeah. I'm sure they'll be here eventually. Uh, where I am in Oregon is supposedly the, like the mushroom foraging capital of the United States or something, just like in this little strip of land right across the street. So that's kind of cool. Very fortunate to be here for that. Uh, and I think the elk finally dropped their antlers last week i think the last couple bulls i saw rooming around my neighborhood finally dropped their antlers uh which was a little bit longer than i expected them to hold on to but uh yeah just looking for to do some shed hunting coming up in my spare time nice nice Corey. what do you got going on our uh, our trout season opened up so i got out there on the first day and we did we did pretty well but Pennsylvania has a pretty extensive stocking program, so it's not like we're get we're catching natives or anything. We're just catching them out of the stocking truck, basically. But it's still fun to catch them, and then doing a little bit of scouting for turkey hunting. But I haven't I haven't had too many good leads on that. Heard some hens yelping the other night. Have have some on my trail camera, but no gobblers yet. I, mean, I think that was a uh, uh, that that was my experience uh last week we went out and the cold front came in uh just the day before and so osseola turkey like to chatter in the springtime when it gets super warm so like there was nothing i was talking to my i went out with actually chase waller and uh he had been out the day before when it was uh the temperature was up in the the 70s in the morning then 80s 80s during the day and he's like he was hearing gobbles all over uh and then the day we went out that morning it was down in the 50s and uh it was just like nothing everything was quiet so bummer but still more time left in the season um kids enjoy the the fishing up that way yeah we got them out we the week before our opening day was the youth trout day and it was at, it was nice it was in the 50s that day which is nice up here and so they had a good day, but when the, the regular opener, it was night. I was standing. It was 19 degrees. When I was standing in the stream. You know, ice was forming on the tip of my rod, so that was fun. 
That's wild, man. <laughs> well, uh, that kind of catches us up. So, Corey, you want to catch us up on uh, Adventures for Food? What's going on in that podcast? Like always, we're releasing new episodes every other Sunday for the Adventures for Food podcast. If you have, if our list, any of our listeners out there have a story they want to tell, hunting, fishing, outdoor related, we'd love to hear it. Uh, send us an email. What's cooking at harvestingnature.com. Yep, we, we love to hear stories. We love to hear your adventures. Always hit on it like it's not about success, uh, you know, failure. It's, it's whatever story you're willing to tell. Um, those are all short, succinct, little 10 to 15 minute stories of like you're sitting around the campfire with your friends, uh, just having a chat, uh, telling what went on in your, your world. So we got the Facebook community group too. We've been uh, inviting a lot of people to that. It's slowly growing. So if you want to come over, it's an awesome place to, to share wild fish and game recipes, share your experiences going out, ask questions, interact. We actually, on tonight's podcast, uh, uh, we have some questions from the group. So Jesse, we posted you're going to be on here and solicited some questions from our followers. So uh, it's a cool little interaction point. So we'll, we'll go through those in a little bit. But if anybody has questions as we as we come through uh and announce different podcasts it's a great platform to do that and then uh as always uh if you want to buy us coffee go for it you can click that link down in the show notes uh we love coffee keeps us fueled keeps us uh creating content through the late hours of the night uh cooking delicious foods and sharing them with you so anytime you want to say thanks with a, a small contribution it's greatly appreciated uh, but outside of that, uh, I kind of want to get to this conversation, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our guest. So our guest today is a world-class chef. He's the owner of Dai Due. It's a butcher shop and supper club in Austin, Texas, where everything on the menu is locally sourced. Uh, he's also the head instructor of the New School of Traditional Cookery, and in 2012, he released A Field, A Chef's Guide to Preparing and Cooking Wild Game and Fish, which was nominated for a James Beard Award. And he's releasing a new cookbook focusing on wild hogs, which we're actually here to talk about tonight. It's the full, oh, there we go. And all right. So our guest today is a world-class chef and owner of Dai Due, a butcher shop and supper club in Austin, Texas, where everything on the menu is sourced locally. He's also the head instructor of the new school of traditional cookery. In 2012, he released a field, a Chef's Guide to Preparing and Cooking Wild Game and Fish, which was nominated for a James Beard Award. He is releasing a new cookbook focusing on wild hogs. I would like to welcome to the Wild Fish and Game podcast, Jesse Griffiths. Hey. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm very happy to be here with y'all. Me too. I'm happy to uh, finally get the chance to chat and uh, talk about this new book too. Yeah. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a long time coming, so I'm I'm very excited to get it in people's hands, and I'm also excited to get it in my own hands. Um, so I'm <laughs> I'm and I'm anticipating it. I've been working on it for a, a, literally a decade. Wow! So it's like a, it's definitely a masterpiece for sure. Well, it's I big. I, I can I can say that much. It's a, it's got some weight to it. I think it's a it's a three and a half pounder uh, for the fishermen out there. It's a it's a large book. It clocks in at I think four hundred and almost four hundred and twenty pages. So oh, it's a, a bit of a a bit of a wild pig textbook. You know, I hope uh, I'd like to see that like the culinary schools just do the butchering section, bring in some wild pigs and and crack open a. Uh, crack open your book is a, is the teaching resource yeah it'd be a great way to tackle that problem get them started with the with the little sheflings you know get them started yep. cutting up just the, uh, used to using feral hog instead of it being kind of a novelty let's get them let's let's normalize it mm-hmm. uh, that's a word that you'll learn in colorado what normalize mm-hmm. i was thinking sheflings uh, <laughs> that's a good one <laughs> <laughs> so um well, if you would, so could you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Uh, we gave a good introduction. I give kudos to Corey for that. It was a solid, yeah. solid read. But um, uh, where you grew up, kind of what got you in the kitchen and the outdoors? Yeah, yeah, certainly. I, I grew up in, in Denton, Texas, which is uh, uh, north of Dallas and Fort Worth, um, kind of a rolling prairie, muddy lakes and little creeks and stuff like that. 
up there uh, and uh, and then grew up fishing. There was a lot of fishing opportunities up there. Did not grow up hunting uh, and came to hunting uh, later in life, but spent a lot of time outdoors uh, in the in the interim and uh, got into cooking kind of, uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, I, I just, I started working in restaurants when I was about 15 uh, and never got out. And so eventually I, I just kind of felt like the, the most viable career that was going to come out of uh, being in restaurants long term would be in the kitchen. So I just kind of moved from waiting tables, bartending, busing, dishwashing, things like that. And eventually just uh, like migrated into the, uh, into the kitchen and stayed there. Uh, and that's where I've been ever since, more or less. Nice. So, w- at what point did the did the two sort of come together? Did you get your introduction to hunting, uh, kind of always being an angler, but get your introduction to hunting, and then sort of mesh all three of those those together? Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. Um, you know, I I'd spent a good deal of time in kitchens by the time I started hunting, and I'd actually trained uh, to be a butcher, uh, or I had been trained for that in a restaurant that I was working in. So I already knew whole animal butchery uh, before I ever killed a large animal. So that was kind of helpful. It was kind of a reverse uh, um, prog- progression for something like that. And, uh, um, and it, it, all, it all eventually tied in, you know, and it, it always had tied in for me, like the connection between, you know, fishing and, and food. And I'd always really appreciated that a lot. And so when I started hunting, it was just very natural. Um, I, I kind of, I feel now that I always wanted to hunt. I just didn't know it. Uh, even when I was a kid, I was just always out in the woods hiding, you know, like I'd love to like play these games, you know, we just like play, you know, capture the flag or hide and seek or anything. But I was just obsessed with like being still and hiding in the woods. And it took me, it took me quite a while to realize, or to make the connection that, that, that I, wanted to hide from animals and then kill them and eat them. Yeah. Almost same exact process. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we, uh, we ran around a lot, uh, growing up doing, uh, you, you know, like you get the BB gun wars, doing stupid kid things like hiding in the <laughs> woods, camouflaged out, shooting each other with BB guns. Yeah. And then, yeah, definitely a, a natural progression. Um, although we weren't eating each other, which is good. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'm sure you were wearing eye protection too, right? <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent. Eye protection, yeah. everything, totally safe. Uh, I think about that back in that time, and like even going in shop class and stuff. And I had a bunch of like welding classes in ag, and it's just like eye protection. You, you like put it on when the teacher was coming around, but you know nowadays you realize what a valuable resource it is. And now I'm like all the time. So. What's uh as you grew into hunting and you got into more into it, moving food to the table? What's what's one of your your favorite hunting memories that sort of stands out uh, to you? I mean, you know that, that's it's hard to pinpoint. I'd say you know I think for most people it'd be hard to pinpoint. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's just a lot, um, and I and I think that you know these answers like to to a question like that is always clouded by what you're excited about right now. You know what I mean, like. And I, I have this weird attention span through the year where I, I will focus on one thing and then I will, I will try to wrap that up and then I'll move on to the next. So after deer season, it becomes around these parts, crappie and white bass season, which is the most manic time of year for me because it's, it can be an intensely short season. It can be three, four, five weeks. And it's also my favorite thing to do. And then after that, I try to get to a point where I have a, I guess, a comfort level in the freezer uh, where I can move on um, from those little fishies into turkeys. And so right now, uh, at the point of recording this podcast, we're in the middle of turkeys. So I'd, I'd, I'd have to say that, I'm, I mean, it's just a prejudice, but my favorite memory right now would probably be of a turkey hunt um, last year. Uh, that I, I was in a county that, that didn't have uh, a lot, a, a very high turkey population. In fact, you're only allowed to take one gobbler a year out of this county. And uh, the landowner uh, had told me that he'd seen turkeys out there and I had access to hunt. And so I went out there. I think I went out maybe two or three times uh, before I even heard a turkey. And then on that, that final time, the, the point of the 
when the story happens. Uh, I, I heard a gobbler off in the distance, you know, the classic, you know, he's, he's out there and then slowly coming in. It was a process of about an hour and 45 minutes of, of getting him in. Uh, and finally the last 60 yards, he, he closed pretty quick. Um, and if anybody, anybody's ever turkey hunted knows this is the best thing in the world <laughs> when this big old, you know, <laughs> gobbler's all strutting in and, uh, you, you're, mostly sure you're going to be able to seal the deal on it and um he closed about 30 yards and i pulled the trigger and the gun went click <laughs> and uh it, it hadn't seated the round uh very well I, I didn't let it like slam home it was a, it's a semi-auto and uh and so he's just there like looking at these two hen decoys and kind of nervously like giving me some looks uh over there while i'm frantically just trying to like you know you know clear the the shell out of the chamber and get another one racked in there which was a pretty noisy process uh but <clears throat> as this is my favorite story obviously it didn't end well for him and i got another one seated in there and 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 got him and he was uh he was a very big very old gobbler and when i got up to him the the thing that i realized right off is that he had a leg band uh which was pretty oh, wow. cool so he had a he had a texas parks and wildlife leg band on him um and on on top of this like kind of really drawn out with a little frantic uh end to it and then i was able to call some some contacts up at parks and wildlife and actually spoke with two biologists about the uh, this band and, and the origin of this turkey, and they they estimated him to be five or six years old, which is remarkably old for a turkey. Um, and he was tagged. I think it was three quarters of a mile away from where I shot him. You know, maybe you know years later, and kind of ex says a lot about their range. But I think it was kind of the combination of all those things: the the setup, the you know, I was there by myself, the calling him in. Uh, the band and then being able to talk to biologists and pick their brains for a couple hours and then kind of get a little backstory on an animal that, you know, normally would never have the opportunity to uh, have any experience or, or insight into what that animal's life was like, but actually it was documented. And so it kind of uh, rounded that experience out quite well. And of course, it was a turkey, so he's also quite delicious. Um, and so I'd say you know, right now on if prodded, that'd probably be my favorite hunting memory, even though it's relatively fresh. That's a that's a solid one. That's a good story. Oh, thank you. Um, I I have a confession. So I I've yet to shoot a turkey. So growing up, I didn't do a lot of turkey hunting. Uh, it's like we did deer season, and, and and that was kind of it. So uh, and then in California, we went out a couple times. But I was in Southern California, and it's like very smart turkey there they only like to stay on private land and we weren't able uh, though although we tried several times to try to get access to private land it's like people uh it, as you could imagine we're not not too friendly of a bunch of dudes traipsing around with shotguns on their property um so unfortunately we never sealed deal there so this year I'm hoping to create one of those great memories and i picture it just as you describe like calling it in like he's coming here the gobble first thing in you know oh I, it gets me excited now, which is good. <laughs> I'm, I am Justin, certainly no Justin. turkey expert. The one thing I can guarantee you is it's not going to happen the way you think it's going to happen. <laughs> it's going <laughs> to he's going to he's going to come in right behind you, or you know, at the moment that you stretch your legs or or whatever. It's a it's a it's a really it's an it's an almost an intense kind of experience because it, it you're very reliant on on these animals to behave one way, and it's it's pretty chaotic. In, in the turkey world yeah or you'll miss oh or yeah and you Corey, you had a similar experience last year didn't you with the uh a misfire i i, I just straight up missed oh uh, that's yeah we roosted them the night before snuck in there that morning watched them fly off the roost they're walking right to us and i rushed a shot and shot over top of them and wanted to throw up so. Well, let's let's talk a little bit, Jesse, about uh, uh about Dai Due. Um, kind of, I I made plans. Uh, you and I were talking a little bit on Instagram back in the fall, and I was making plans to try to get over there, and we ended up not not being able to make it due to travel stuff and having to get up into Wyoming. But um, uh, 
uh, still excited. I think it, it's definitely at the top of my list when I come back to visit in Austin, which will probably be sometime next year, I'm guessing, but um, excited. But uh, so what What was your inspiration with getting it started and, and uh, the origins behind it? Well, we started it in 2006, 2006, a long time ago. Um, we started off as a supper club, so just kind of a renegade underground dinner, uh, traveled around, would do a dinner on a farm, um, you know, just kind of staying one step ahead of the health department at all times <laughs> and, uh, and only serving locally sourced ingredients. So go to the farmer's market Saturday morning and gather all this stuff or, you know, gather stuff from wherever we, we could, you know, using Texas olive oil and peaches and blackberries and fish from the Gulf and wild game, uh, things like that. And just trying to go a hundred percent, um, and serving these dinners and it started with I think a dinner for maybe 13 people and then within a year or two uh, we were doing dinners for 80 people uh, almost weekly I'd say about three weeks a month doing about 40 dinners a year um, and it, it, it turned into kind of a, a, a bigger thing and we started uh, going to the farmers market ourselves and had a booth there and we would make sausage and pickles uh, and sell brined chickens and all kinds of like cuts of meat and anything preserved or fermented. And then uh, also started cooking on site at the farmer's markets, making tacos and biscuits and gravy, things like that. So in that and uh, around the same time, we started uh, the New School of Traditional Cookery, which um, incorporated butchery classes uh, into a, a, a guided hunt weekend. Um, and that became also pretty successful and very, very fun. Uh, probably the best job I've ever had. Um, and so uh, kind of a lot of things. And then in 2014, finally opened a brick and mortar restaurant, which was great, you know, just to have a roof over our heads, finally. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, Daidui, the restaurant has been there on the east side of Austin since 2014. And uh, kind of continuing on with the traditions that we we started and then the ethos of of just using locally sourced products you know very seasonal kind of restricted sometimes by what we have or what we don't have um but a fun way to cook and uh just very reflective of of what we have here our wine list is all texas wines which is uh, some people rub some people the wrong way but sorry I, I had uh, I had the opportunity to try some some Texas wines here last year and I, I, I'd say they're they're good. There's room for growth, but uh, as with anything, I can't vouch for all of them. Like no, I mean by <laughs> by no means. No, there's some there are some god awful Texas wines out there. Um, it can't be any worse than Pennsylvania wines. Well, no, I, I honestly, have not tried Pennsylvania wines, but I would give them a shot. Um, I mean, not, not to digress too much into the wines, but it's a it's a it's there's some very good ones out there and then there's a lot of, of fluff out there too um and it's you know you have to really get dig in and, and find the really good producers and and we're very strict also about where the where the grapes come from like they have to come from texas so a lot of the producers and i like to say a lot of the producers that aren't producing the greatest wines are also outsourcing their grapes from places like california and arizona no offense to those places but i think that you know, when you have a restaurant that's serving things that are just from this region, it's probably best served with a nice wine from this region also. Mm-hmm. And wine, not really comparable to a wine from France or Oregon. Uh, it's a wine from Texas. It's going to be a little rough around the edges and, uh, and, and distinct in its own ways. And I think that embracing that was a key part of, of how we reflected on what was available from here. And then we kind of strange to to say that we're going to support all these farmers from the farmer's market we're going to buy our lettuce and our pork and you know the beets and the carrots from these farmers but we're not going to support the great farmers so in the end we supported the great farmers too i think that's yeah that's a solid move and you know i i like the circle i mean i i I heard about sort of your your local sourcing uh, a while ago and I, I thought it was such an awesome concept and uh, definitely even the wine just kind of like it, it puts the full circle, which is cool. Cause it, you know, 
you're not taking shortcuts. You're making it all the way around. Right. And it's ironic to, to consider it almost a concept um, because it is, it is one of the oldest concepts known to man. It's, it's probably mm-hmm. top two. Um, <laughs> and it, it is definitely an, an old idea to just let's eat the stuff that we have around us, you know, once out of necessity and now out of, you know, a, kind of a whole panoply of, of ethos and, and, and ideals behind that. But, I, um, you know, and a lot of, a lot of restaurants, you know, support local and some say that they're, you know, very, very local and stuff. But I, I think our, our whole thing was, was kind of beyond that. We were really wanted to represent Texas in a proud way uh, in central Texas specifically and say, Hey, this is, this is what our food is. Um, you know, much in the way is, you know, Morocco or France or Vietnam, um, uh, like they, their, their cuisines are all based on, on resources. And so why shouldn't we do that? But since we came to it so late in the game, you know, these, these other countries and cultures have been doing it for centuries. What we did have is the luxury of, of ideas, of, of having ideas from everywhere else. And not to mention the, all the amazing influences that Texas has, like, I mean, a, a substantial Vietnamese community, uh, Mexico, obviously. Cajuns, uh, Germans, and Czechs, and all that stuff. So not only do we have those like regional influences here, but you know, just because of the modernity of of when we when we're operating, uh, we're able to to take ideas from all over the world and apply them to our ingredients. So I think it's just it's just been a really fun ride. I mean, it, uh, yeah, it, it shines through. You know, in having not tasting the food, but seeing the food, it definitely shines through, and the passion is present. Uh, you know, just through the way you talk about it and the way I've, I've seen your plates and, and food depicted on various channels. So I think that's pretty solid. Um, so have you, have you run into any challenges over the past year with, with maintaining sourcing local, local stuff? Uh, I mean, farmers across the nation have been running into some, some speed bumps. Uh, I think is, is that, been felt as equally there in central texas that's it i mean i'd say that's it that's an excellent question because I'll, I'll i'll break that down into two different like happenings you know when covid first started um and supply chains started to break uh or or at least the perception was they were breaking and that well you know famously we ran out of toilet paper um and then meat was in short supply as well um, and at that point, because we had such direct supply chains to farmers, ranchers, particularly ranchers, <clears throat> we were we were able to source food readily through all of that. We were still getting meat because we weren't operating in this industrialized commodity system that was suffering mm-hmm. from having people run to the store and fill up these shopping carts full of stuff, and then, you know just just you know, taxing the supply. And so at that point, because we were directly connected to most of our purveyors uh, and, and they weren't going to go sell that somewhere else, we were able to stock a lot of food. And we turned into a grocery store early on. We were selling lots and lots of vegetables, milk, um, and meats because um, we have a little butcher counter in the restaurant anyway. And, so, and then we just started selling flour and pinto beans and salt and stuff. After a couple months, our biggest sellers, this is the strangest thing, and it's such a you know, 2020 statement, our, our biggest sellers were bandanas and yeast. Um, and we used to be a restaurant. And then in one day, I'm just like, we went through a 50-pound bag of active dry yeast, sold that retail um, in like three weeks. And it's because everybody was baking bread at home. They're all in quarantine and they're just experimenting with breaking, baking bread. And then everybody's got bandanas on their faces and they want to have a, a cool bandana. And we had those. Uh, so there is that instance where these local supply chains are about as important as they possibly can be. And they really reinforce what, you know, I've been saying all along. Then, um, if you kind of fast forward to the ice storm that I, I think most of the country at least heard in passing about that happened mm-hmm. down here, which was quite an event, you know? Um, I mean, granted other places are that cold often, 
Texas is not. Um, I think one of my friends, I heard him say, it'd be like a hurricane hitting Nebraska. And that's what it was like. Um, it was very cold for a long time. Um, many of the trees and plants in Austin are dead, like just dead forever. Like all the bamboo, all the citrus, everything just wiped out. You know, it's crazy to drive around town in spring and everything is vibrantly green. I'm sorry, half the things are vibrantly green. And half things are just dead uh, from this big ice storm. But so when that happened, uh, kind of the converse happened too. And so local supply chains were broken, but the more, uh, like, uh, widespread, uh, supply chains, like nationwide supply chains, your more commodity, uh, approaches to the market, uh, were a little bit stronger because our farmers were frozen and having trouble getting to literally driving anywhere for, for a week. Um, and so, but then other, once the grocery stores and, and the other uh, you know, distribution companies were able to get kind of back up and running, they were able to recover more quickly. So um, within that year, we saw two very different um, ways where the local sourcing uh, was, was really impactful. And that when there's a large problem, it's great. But when there's an acute local problem, uh, we suffered, if that makes sense. Got it. Yeah, so two two very different scenarios and and played out in different ways. So uh, I I think it's cool that that you opened up and were selling commodities. I think I, I saw that on uh, on on your the Instagram page for the restaurant there uh, during the ice storm that you guys were just selling stuff and and doing food and uh, yeah. Well, for the last year we have when we yeah we we're selling gallons of milk and and butter and and flour and things like that turned into a little bit of a grocery store but you know you gotta hey you know what it works yeah it works helps out everybody yeah yeah you were talking about how one of the oldest concepts is uh using things that are around you like locally sourced food items and everything but i think that also goes hand in hand with a one-stop shop store for butcher shop in there you have your grocery items so all mm-hmm. things we need here and get food that is made here mm-hmm. it's also a, a pretty old concept i don't know how old but it seems like a yeah for a, sure an older concept that goes kind of hand in hand with it. well cool. a neighborhood place a place where you can mm-hmm. you can walk or it's a short drive you know and, and that's you know i've the the neighborhood we opened the restaurant in is the neighborhood that i've lived in for over 20 years and so when it came time to set up the brick and mortar i was adamant that it had to be in this area because i'm like the concept is local and it's like i want to be a local to the place you know i need to be here uh in my own neighborhood selling food from there to my neighbors and i didn't want to you know commute across town and 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 do the same thing so but it, it, it ties in and then when things go south you know you're you're there for your literal neighbors too makes me think about uh my my great grandmother is my my step grandmother step great grandmother I guess so I, I knew her so she's uh, a little younger but she uh, immigrated from Italy um, I, I don't know when back in the 50s or 60s but she would still like go to the market every day she didn't keep a lot of stuff stocked at her house maybe like some dry goods and stuff like that but to go get the fresh meat or get you know fresh produce it was always that local trip to her her local neighborhood mart and and i think about how you know people the habits of people have changed uh shifting away from some of that locality and some to the you know the bigger box stores or the the national food system and and the way that it plays into that way and i always think it's interesting to take a look at that and and in instances like these where it kind of uh it put challenges on both systems and and to see sort of how everyone reacts and uh you know business owners how they're able to adapt and change and and serve their community given the opportunities uh, i think it's pretty solid so looking at that so as far as uh of course got some notes in here on the menu um so I know you guys do fish, a lot of fish, and you do game meats too, uh, as well. How often do you? Is there a primary game meat you serve, or how often do you rotate out, and kind of what's what's normally on the on the plates on the meat side? 
Well, menu changes often, and you know when when the we'll we'll have our dining room fully reopened here soon. The menu will get back to its former size, you know, which gives us a lot more leeway. Uh, there's two prominent game meats that are available, and they're available on the and featured on that menu for a couple reasons. Um, one, very obviously, is going to be feral hog, and the other is nil guy. Um, I appreciate both of those uh, because they're invasive species. Uh, they're they're readily available, uh, and we can get them inspected and shipped to the restaurant, and you know very very quickly um the feral hog comes in once a week and we can get the nil guy uh, like overnighted to us about four nights a week uh, nil guy specifically doesn't uh they don't go to corn feeders and these animals are all super wild they live just in the brush country in south texas uh they're they're very renewable uh there's they live on these giant ranches and so there's not a lot of pressure on them and so to me the I mean, for lack of a better term, the sustainability of that uh, is is key and very attractive. Uh, in that, you know, killing nil guy and, and serving them in a in a restaurant uh, situation is just it makes a lot of sense uh, because they're just a great animal. You're getting a very good product. You get an animal that's uh, been harvested uh, in a great way. Uh, they this this company we get them from they have shooters they go out there and they they shoot them in the field so there's no stress they're inspected on site chilled down and transported and dry aged a little bit and then uh butchered and shipped and so it's a really great product and it enables us to offer true wild game this is not farmed venison it's not you know it's it it's not something that's in a pen at all i mean these are actual wild animals and they actually they, they don't eat corn so even if there was a feeder anywhere near them, which there isn't, uh, they wouldn't be eating at it. And they're just, they're eating a, a very natural organic diet. And so, and, and they're harvested very uh, efficiently and uh, humanely. And then there's the feral hogs. Uh, and obviously I, I have a bit of a fascination with those. <laughs> uh, and that is the, that's the supreme uh, uh, sustainable ingredient. I mean, these are invasives and we, we must control them. It's just, it's imperative that we control feral hogs. Um, and so it's, it's the moral thing to do. Uh, and so serving feral hog also, uh, just plays into a lot of things, um, for us, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's an efficient meat. It's, it's delicious. Um, a lot of people have never tried it and maybe a little scared of it. Um, and so, and we're able to get them in, we get trapped pigs, um, not at the restaurant, but they're, they're brought in live to a, a processor about an hour and a half West of Austin that we deal with, uh, uh, quite a bit and they're brought in live. They're inspected before they're killed. They're killed and they're inspected again. And then they get a little blue Texas stamp on them and then they're, uh, ready to go into the food system at that point. And so they can be shipped out and sold and, and we buy quite a bit of feral hog, uh, and, and put that on the menu a lot. Um, obviously I like to have that on the menu. Um, we do also have things like domestic pork and beef. Um, and then also things like, you know, farm raised quail, farm raised duck, uh, and then lots and lots of fish out of the Gulf every once in a while. If sources, uh, enable us to, we'll have some freshwater fish like we've served freshwater drum, uh, catfish, gar, um, trying to think of anything else, you know, things like, and then seasonal items, also like crawfish, shrimp, blue crab, things like that, oysters. Have you ever had hog not or tested negatively? Like, have it, have it come back where you can't use it, or would you even know about that? Uh, I wouldn't know about it. They would, they would do what they call condemn it at the uh, at the slaughterhouse. Um, if there is anything that signified visually that it was unsafe uh like a spotty liver or you know some some discrepancies not discrepancies but like uh irregularities on the inside of the rib cages things like that that the inspector knows to look for so i wouldn't know about it um and almost universally the pigs the feral hogs we get in are quite tasty um now obviously they come in and they can be any different size so when we order in a, a carcass i mean it's gonna be anywhere from 30 to 180 pounds and i just made up those numbers 
Um, I mean, just all over the place. But what that what that does is it doesn't enable you to consistently put chops on the menu because you never know how big these pigs are going to be. Not to mention you don't know how fat they're going to be. So uh, the the consistency isn't there. And so what we do is aggregate uh, feral hog meat typically. So we're going to braise it. We're going to make a confit out of it. We're going to grind it into a sausage, something that equalizes all those different sizes but back to your question no we don't uh we don't know if if there's one that's condemned and in my estimation it's going to be very rare that that happens um and then the hogs we do get in are pretty consistently good um which is also notable because they're stressed out um they've been trapped and driven around in a trailer which they do not like (laughs) and Mm -hmm. brought to a facility where they might sit for a day or two before slaughter and these i mean if you've ever encountered a feral hog they are uh, a little upset when you put them behind the fence um and they can get a little rowdy uh but uh to that question no we we don't experience uh, anything um on our end that would indicate that that they're not completely fit for consumption and they typically are quite delicious also do, do you typically do some taste testing yourself before before you uh, put that on the menu? No, no. We we go through so many. Um, I think at peak, you know, like pre COVID, we we're probably going through three or four hundred hogs a year. Ooh. That's a lot of hogs. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, just and that was well, we had two restaurants at the time. One has since closed. Um, but, and that was a taco place and it was primarily a uh, feral hog and nil guy in the tacos. So, um, we were, we were burning through a lot. So no, I don't have, I don't have opportunity to try every one of those try as I might Now, if they're in taco form, I, I might be able to get to all of them, but, uh, no, we just, we, we just trust that it's, it's good. I mean, we try everything, like every batch of sausage, somebody's, somebody's tasting it before it get, gets cased and things like that. And. Uh, but no, I'd say the consistency is there, um, and they're they're quite good. We're getting mostly mid-sized pigs, so uh, for the most part. But um, but I'd say they're 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 all very good. Um, you mentioned sausage and taste testing sausage, and it reminds me. So I, I was watching the 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 media the most recent season where you're on there making and uh your the tortilla uh, in the sausage is is the binder that uh, you blew my mind. Like what? Uh, what was sort of the inspiration that you got behind that? Honestly, don't remember, but it's probably just you know thinking about binders. You know, um, it could you know like a traditional British sausage is going to have some sort of binder, be it a rusk or or oats. Uh, you know, in Spain, it's going to be rice. In Louisiana, it's going to be rice. And it didn't take much of a leap to think, why don't you grind a tortilla? into a sausage as a as a bit of a binder but more more than a binder that that sausage that's there for flavor and it's mm-hmm. it's such a recognizable and comp- i mean for me or i guess anybody who grew up eating enchiladas you know it's just like that or eating chips and salsa you know that a tortilla is such a comforting flavor and so and just grinding some of those in there along with some like pretty much burnt onions uh and any kind of meat really i mean feral hog duck nil guy venison uh works in that sausage and then you know some some chilies um you know maybe a little bit of cinnamon a little bit of vinegar to kind of balance that out and you've got a you've got a pretty good sausage i'll uh i'll just let everybody know so as always we we include all the all our little conversation points especially with the recipes and the foods we'll uh we put those down in the show notes so you get a an opportunity to go investigate that a little further if you like. But yeah, that was, that was some solid. And I actually, uh, I was grinding some sausage the other day and, uh, always like towards the end of my sausage grind, I'll take whatever's meats left in the, uh, in the grinder. I'll throw something in there to run through it, uh, just to kind of push the last bits of meat out. And then I'll usually, uh, usually eat that save that for myself and just make it into the patties or whatever and i threw tor- corn tortillas in there and had mixed it in with some antelope that i had from wyoming and made like little tortilla antelope patties and uh man uh, that flavor flavor popped really well uh with the corn so it was it was solid that's good
Well, it's a perfect segue, actually, uh, into talking about the hog book, since we're on the conversation of wild pigs and sausage making and all those great things. So uh, that's a good segue. Um, so looking at the book, the book's due to come out uh, here pretty soon. Um, and we're obviously one of our main talking points in this episode is the book. So uh, we've got a little bit of conversation about this and I have a couple questions for you after that uh, from our some of our listeners, but, um, as far as the book itself, we, we touched on it earlier, uh, long time in the making, uh, which is pretty solid. Um, sounds like three to 400 hogs a year. You've had a lot of, a lot of time to do a, a lot of solid research. Uh, so that's pretty awesome. What, uh, what led you down the street to say, um, the next book's going to be the, the wild hog book? Well, you know, we, we, been doing these classes, a lot of butchery classes for a long time, and then also the, the hunting schools where we have a lot of really good direct interaction with people uh, that are hunters or they're curious or they're starting to hunt or maybe they're just kind of the, the foodie types and or uh, just coming to a class because, I mean, maybe it's just almost a novelty. But the very, very common thing, theme uh, with all of these people and their questions was feral hogs because in in Texas that, that that population has absolutely exploded since the 80s or 90s and they've really crept into our collective consciousness a lot more and so people were constantly asking questions about feral hogs and like I, I kind of touched on earlier they're they're kind of a perfect food um, in that you know I, I've never had the uh, pleasure of debating a vegetarian about the consumption of feral hogs, but I sure would love to, if there's any vegetarian podcasters <laughs> tuned in right now. Um, I would, I mean, not, I'm not trying to bait anyone or be, be snippy about it, but I mean, I really would like to, to hear um, how you can morally justify I don't know, putting them in zoos or whatever the, 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 the other solution is uh, to something that's becoming such a, a incredibly rampant problem. Uh, and that, mm -hmm. you know, there, you can't drive down a, 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 a highway without just seeing a dead pig anymore. I mean, they're everywhere. Uh, I live in town and I could probably travel three quarters of a mile from where I am and still be in Austin. Um, and they'll, there will be hog, there's hog sign on the hike and bike trail. My daughter's school basically overrun with hogs. And it's almost out of town. It's still in the city limits of Austin. But there are uh, sounders of over 50 pigs um, just down the hill from her school that sleep in abandoned barns down, down in this area. I mean, there's, it is a rampant problem. And with that comes, you know, how do we control that problem? And then the next, I mean, the next step in that is like, oh, are they good to eat? And the answer is absolutely, are they good to eat? They're, they're very, very good. Um, and then I think the fun part of that is, is not everybody realizes that they're good. And there's a lot of what I call generational mythology behind it, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I heard you can't eat a pig over 135 pounds. And you know, like, well, wait, what? Uh, where did you hear that? Well, somebody told me that. And it's like, well, who, where did he hear it? Well, somebody else told him that. And it's like, okay, so any of you three people, have you ever eaten a 136 pounder? And the answer is usually no, um, because I never tried it. And so the, the, the disinformation and the just, just general, um, like I said, mythology behind them and their edibility specifically uh, it was pretty fascinating because all of my experiences, almost 100% um, of my experiences with feral hogs, is that in one way or another, they're very good to eat. Um, if you treat them kind of as a blanket recipe, um, that can be problematic. Like someone, I mean, I've, I've been asked multiple times, what's your favorite recipe for feral hog? And that's a really hard question because that hog could be, a six pound piglet or it could be a 350 pound boar 
Um, and obviously you're not going to be able to apply the same recipe to both of those animals and have success with it. And so that's where it becomes a little more complicated. And I think what that has also done is it reinforced the mythology of their inedibility. And so I, I just became kind of fascinated with discovering how not, not really, uh, the, the methods, um, to, to control these animals and turn them into food, but the methods of communicating to people to empower them to, to get out there and try it and, and with confidence and know that they could do it and that, that the things that they'd heard weren't necessarily true. Uh, and because we had so much interpersonal communication with clients and people coming to classes like that and I heard all the questions that I became, it's, it's kind of a quest. It's like, oh, what, I, what, I, what we need to do is just talk to everybody and teach them and, and show them that, that it's absolutely possible and do it in a way that wasn't preachy or complicated and kind of set up a really basic system of analyzing the hog you have on the ground and then determining what you can cook with it in the highest and best use of that six-pound piglet or that 350-pound boar. Nice. I think that, uh, that's pretty solid. Do you, do you think, I mean, I guess, do you see that people's opinion of, of the consumption of wild hog is changing? Cause like growing up, uh, it, it's definitely like that generational, um, dissuasion of eating pig. You know, we had them in Oklahoma, uh, out and around, but they weren't as prevalent as they are today. And, you know, I still, just like you said, run across people that turn up their nose. And I'm just like, have you ever eaten them? And they're like, no. Well, I'm like, you got to at some point pull the trigger. And I'm I'm wondering, through your interactions, have, have you been able to scope that to see more more or less people interested? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that if you, if you graft the interest in cooking game right now, it's off the charts. I mean, it's, it's, mm-hmm. you know, you're part of this, you know, you've done this meat eaters done a fantastic job of, I mean, I don't want to say guilting people into enjoying their food, but at least, uh, illuminating, I mean, for lack of a better word, the hypocrisy of not enjoying game as much as you should as uh, no, it's not as much as you should as much with as much effort and energy as you put into getting it, you know? Like, oh, mm-hmm. allow me to digress for a second in that, you know, plucking a dove, you know, once you get good at it, it takes maybe three or four minutes per dove. And let's say you've had a great night and you shot a limit of doves, you're looking at 45 minutes of plucking. And most people will tell me I'm crazy for doing that. And then I'll be like, well, how long did you drive to get to your dove field? Well, an hour. I'm like, well, that's an hour that's 15 minutes longer than just sitting there plucking the doves and you can legally drink beer while you're plucking doves <laughs> and so I, I i don't i don't i don't know you know when this happened when this like like shift in consciousness happened but i, I definitely see it and i love it and i think it's great because it just really benefits everyone it's a higher usage. People are excited. And I'm, I'm consistently blown away by the food that I see. I mean, just on Instagram alone, you know, the, the, mm-hmm. that what we, you know, so-called amateur cooks are making at home. And it looks phenomenal. I mean, I'm looking at this like, that looks so good. I would eat that. And it's exciting. It's very exciting to see. And, and if, you know, we can be even just a small part of getting people excited about that. And educating, um, and then they're gonna they're gonna take that and they're gonna keep it going. They're gonna they're gonna run with that ball, and I, I think that's just like that's just a really fun thing to be involved with. Um, and hogs are, are since they have kind of the most mythology around them as to their edibility, and the most confusion is about like, well, can you eat them? Is it even safe or this and that? That uh, they're they're just the most fun topic for me. Uh, to tackle and then regionally i'm at the epicenter of the hog infestation in texas here i mean we got most of them in the whole country we have the plurality of them here so uh it was just a no-brainer uh for me and i I just i'm fascinated by them i I respect them i love pigs i think they're cool 
Um, I think they're sometimes they're they're beautiful. You know, some of the hides look really cool. Um, they're they're just a fascinating, prescient, super intelligent animal. Uh, they they can be very hard to hunt. Um, like I said, I have a lot of respect for them, and I also kill every single one of them <laughs> that I see. I'm sorry, but uh, you know it's but and not feel bad about it. You know, I don't like to inflict uh, undue pain on them or anything like that. I'm not cruel about it, but um, but definitely uh, we we got to get we got to get in front of them. And uh, well, I mean, what a what a what a cool problem to have. Yep. I had a, we had a while back, we, we had a, a trapper from down in Texas. Uh, he, he commented and, and his sort of thought was like, we're sort of, from his approach, he was waging war on, on pigs and uh, he wasn't quite as supported as, as them as a food commodity. And I don't know if it was unique to his situation with the way he was sort of trapping and the amount of hogs he was having to deal with. But I don't know. I, I, I find it hard to wrap my head around that we can't have the viable food source in them, uh, you know, given the sustainability and, and the the need to get ahead of it, just like you said. Like, it, we got to be able to do something. And I, I think turning more people onto it as a food may be that route. Well, I think the approach is more to eat more of them, eat more of the dead ones. Um, and I get it. You know, it's like if you talk to a carrot farmer, you'd be like, how many carrots do you eat? They're probably going to be like, I hate carrots, you know, Uh, uh, you know, somebody that traps, you know, 30, 40 pigs a day after a while, is just going to be like, you know what, I I want beef. (laughs) Um, And (laughs) and and I kind of get it, you know, Um, and I think that the the right. The, the, the appropriate uh, tack to, to take with that is instead of, you know, like I said, is, you know, we can't really be preachy about it. It's just to try to convince people to eat more of them um, instead of just the wanton waste. Um, and I think that, you know, I think it's a lot about goals. And if we, if we can say our, our goal is that we eat all of them, you know, knowing we're never going to hit that goal. But wouldn't it be cool if we could eat all of them? And, you know, maybe we could, you know, feed, feed people and, and, in prisons. I don't know. We'd mm-hmm. feed, feed, feed people that don't have access to quality proteins. I think that'd be amazing. I mean, cause there's people literally starving in this country. And then we're, we're going up in helicopters and knocking down 30 of these pigs in an afternoon. And I know that that's not, those two things don't necessarily have to coincide and intersect. But um, what if we just make it our goal and we just work towards that? And so I think that, you know, I, I see his point of view and he's right. Um, and you're also right. And so what we need to do, the task at hand is is finding that ex- intersection and, and, and thinking about it. And, we, you know, we've talked regulatory in, uh, agencies and hunters and trappers and the general public and people in the nonprofit sector and biologists, uh, and game wardens, and legislators, and we're going to have to all figure out how we can tie this resource in uh, together. You know, this this thing that's super delicious, how we can get it to more people. And so it's just going to be baby steps at first, but I don't think it's an it's an impossibility. Jesse, do you know if any of the meat ever goes to like homeless shelters or? food banks or anything like that it's up here in Oregon I've taken part in a couple of deer callings mm-hmm. and I think they're even talking about elk callings coming up because mm-hmm. that elk, we have 200 strong herds of elk that walk right across the 101 and just mm-hmm. get creamed by mm-hmm. Mack trucks and, stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and they total the Mack trucks because they're so big yeah. uh, do you know if that's happening down there because like, that seems like it would be a perfect solution is, you know, yeah. just be the, be the hungry be the homeless put them in food banks yeah, it, if it's happening, it's minimal, um, and it's okay. probably more on a person-to-person basis. I mean, I know I know some a ranch manager on a giant ranch, and they they kill a lot of pigs out there. And he he to his cre- his infinite credit, this man and his crew clean all these hogs. And as far as I know, they just drive them into town and give them away, which is kind of a micro uh, system of the, of. of food distribution mm-hmm. but i mean in one in a way it's quite beautiful 
It's just the, the you know people taking care of people right there, um, without you know having to go through any kind of agency. Um, when you specifically start talking about pigs, you know, and swine, and the incumbent uh, dangers that come with them, like tularemia and trichinosis and pseudo rabies and brucellosis and things like that, um, there is a, a a standard of regulation that absolutely has to happen, and so that's where it, it becomes even more complicated. It's not just so much as, as like what we want to do is just distribute this into the food system because it's not without danger. Um, and not to say, not to scare anybody away from eating them. I eat them all the time. I ate, I ate them right before I started talking to you. I ate um, um, some feral hog <laughs> for dinner. It's fine, I'm, you know, and, and but there does need to be a standard of regula regulation before we just say, oh, hey, anybody that ever kills a pig, or, you know, one on the side of the road, blah, blah, blah. Let's just, you know, get it out there and let's just turn it into breakfast sausage and give it to the hungry. Um, so it's a complication. I mean, it's, it's a nuanced problem. And, and my, so far, my only solution is that we need to come up with a solution for it and think about it more. But to your point, there is not a lot of distribution of feral hog specifically to the needy. Um, there's not, there's definitely not enough of it. Good. Yeah. I think, uh, I think to, to your point, having, having the, having these conversations and bringing up the, the, the topic, it's like one of the first stage and any good plan is you just gotta have a bunch of people sitting around talking about it. And then people are like, huh? So maybe, uh, not to say we're going to reach the, the wide ends of, of, of the world here, but, uh, I'd love to, to hear more conversation. And, and for those out there listening, like if, if you have experiences or you have stories, uh, where you see more wild pigs going out to your community or see more creative resources that you see, share them with us, uh, you know, we'd love to pass them on and discuss them and talk about them. So, uh, it's a great thing, great thing to do. Um, I do, I do want to talk about some recipes in the book though. As we've uh, we, we've hit on, I think a lot of the philosophy behind it and the motivation, um, but we haven't talked about the the food yet, which is uh, which is good. So um, I think uh, the first one that I saw on uh, on on Instagram was the feral sow's milk ricotta cheese. <laughs> So Corey and I were talking about this, and Corey's like, "Is was that a uh, was that an April Fool's joke?" Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, nobody's milking a sow. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> it's a delightful visual, I will say, just out there, dee, 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 you know, trying to like just <laughs> soothing her and petting her on the back and maybe whispering in her ear while you while you milk a hundred and fifty pound ball of pure aggression. Uh, no, uh, that was a, that was a, uh, April Fool's joke for sure. It's getting harder and harder to tell which, like, especially in April Fool's, mm -hmm. uh, serious, which ones are. Oh yeah, it was, come up with some crazy stuff out there. it was dry. I'll give you that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah. So, uh, is there another recipe you wanted to talk about? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now that we got that question out of the way, <laughs> um, the, is it Pone Haas? Is that, am I pronouncing it correctly? I make it known in the introduction to that recipe that I, I myself don't know how to pronounce it. That is um, uh, probably more of a question for Corey, and that that is a, a, a northeastern uh, dish right there. But it's, it's basically scrapple. Uh, so it's cornmeal, um, uh, like a really heavy pork stock, and I, I feel like the, the kidneys uh, thrive in there. They're very good. Offer a good amount of texture. Also a good way to use up kidneys. And you can make a really big batch of this. Uh, I call it ponos. I'm definitely mispronouncing it. My apologies to um, whatever conglomeration of North northeastern United States cultures um, came up with it. Uh, so it, I, I love it personally. It's cornmeal cake basically with, you know, all kinds of stuff in it, like little shreddy bits of pork and pork kidneys and sage and red pepper. And we sweeten it with a little bit of uh, cane syrup. 
uh, like or you know basically like molasses almost, and then you you cook it down and then uh, put it in a loaf pan, chill it, slice it, and then fry that. Um, it's just fantastic breakfast, um, really good stuff. So I mean we try to obviously tackle all the parts of the hog and. Um, and I've found that, you know, if you're going to convince somebody to eat offal out of a hog, and maybe they're not even really keen on eating the hog, um, and then you've got you've to crest another summit when you're trying to get them to eat the liver and the heart and the kidneys. Um, mm-hmm. And in that case, those recipes have to be extremely approachable. And, you know, that'd be really, really good. And, uh, and then that first time someone hopefully makes that, that, that dish with, with pork kidneys in it and then feed it to their kids and the kids are like, this is great, you know, cause it's pretty good and it's, and it's very mild. Um, and it's just a good way to use those things up. And so we really try our, I, I really try to focus on recipes like that for the book, you know, like, like really, I don't want to say middle of the road, but like, you know, just something that's going to convince people to, to come on board Team Ophel if they, if they want to make that, you know, that transition. Uh, and so a dish like that, I think, is a really good gateway into getting there. Nice. All right, uh, so we're fortunate both Corey and Colin are from Pennsylvania, so I want to pick their brain to see if they, uh, if they in fact have heard the the pronunciation of this, I'm a huge Scrapple fan. So this, this is an awesome recipe for me, but, um, you two gentlemen from the, the great white Northeast, what, what are your thoughts? I've never had Scrapple or anything like that. So I, I, I don't have, I don't have an opinion on it. I've never had it. I think I've had it once. Usually call it by another name. Uh, Something on a shingle. Mm. Does that sound right, Corey? <laughs> no, no, I've never heard of shit on a shingle until Justin's recipe on the meat eater. Yeah, I oh, thought that yeah. was more of like a creamed meat on a on like toast or something, right? Right, right. Yeah. Um, maybe I'm getting yep. too confused. Yeah, yeah. Then. yeah. All right, I'll I'll step out. No, I don't have an opinion on it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. Well, I, uh, somebody's got to. All right, well. <laughs> I, I mean, for me, I, I haven't really gotten into. It sounds delicious. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So all my, all my Spanish uh, taco pronunciations are pretty spot on. So, so I mean, I, I'm good there, and I can correct, I can correct some, some Yankees on that, and then I'll, I'll stand corrected on my, my Pon Haas. Uh, pronunciation or even the uh, viability or the how traditional it is and how much i've corrupted it which i'm sure i have but um it's good so talking about wild uh or hog wings so that and actually this is going to give me the opportunity to ask a question uh from one of our our listeners uh was curious about this so I, i'll ask a question first we can talk about it, then we'll talk about the recipe but the the knife and mallet trick um what's uh how did you come up with that or where did you learn it and sort of the the method methodology behind it i don't i don't actually remember where i first picked up the knife and mallet but i want to be completely clear that it's not something that i i created or, or developed um, and it's a, it's a pretty old standard butchery technique. And, um, I love it in particular. And let me back up and explain just what it, what it means. It's just like very simply, you have a cleaver, um, a thin bladed cleaver. And instead of whacking where you want that cleaver to go, like you, you know, imagine in like a movie about a butcher where they just start hitting something really hard with the cleaver. Instead, you just hold the cleaver in one hand and then with a simple, hardware store rubber mallet in the other hand you hit that cleaver and it just goes with extreme precision where you want it to go um i really prefer it over a saw and in fact i hate using bone saws um because it doesn't create a lot of bone dust and it's fast and i I just feel it works a lot better um and i can break down any size pig with a boning knife a cleaver and a rubber mallet and i'm talking about just a standard hardware store uh, mallet it needs to be a rubber head like metal won't work um, and then a cleaver 
Um, I prefer a really thin bladed cleaver. Um, the brand that I use is an old hickory, uh, which is extremely cheap. I mean, you're looking at $25 brand new and you could probably pick one up on eBay for about 10. Um, carbon steel, easily sharpened cleaver. And when you're cutting through the spine or the ribs or cutting chops and things like that, a moderately sharp cleaver and a mallet will get you pretty much everywhere you need to be on that. And it, it's just a really good, once you get fairly good with that as, as butchery tools, um, and I feel like they just become very efficient. You don't have a lot of big equipment to take care of. I mean, you, your, your whole kit for breaking down a whole animal is basically two knives and a mallet. Um, and I, I just, I love that. And it enables me to cut uh, ribs and things like the hog ribs, which are basically just these small strips, uh, cross cut, a horizontal cut on uh, a rack of ribs and then would go through and then um, break apart each individual little riblet to create a little, uh, I mean, chicken wing sized piece of, of rib. And it works best with a medium sized hog. Um, a bigger hog would be just a little too big for it. So like your little, your kind of your standard, you know, 30 to 70 pounder, uh, uh, pig, which seems to be almost a predominant size. There's a lot of feral hogs out there that size. Like those ribs of that size, you go through and you just cross cut them and come back in and divide it out. And of course, you're listening to me describe it. But the better the better option for figuring out how to do this would be to go buy the damn book. Um, and it'll, the, yep. it'll be <laughs> presented in a much more pictorial <laughs> and visual format for you to, to understand. And then those are par cooked. Um, I par cook them in water. Um and then until they're just tender, but still have a bit of chew. But what we're going for here is chicken wings, which are undeniably one of the uh, most grand creations in human history. Um, chicken wings are, are fantastic. <laughs> um, and it's the, it's the only, here's, here's a factoid. It's the only meat that I've purchased in the last 10 years is chicken wings. Uh, I, I basically just eat, you know, pigs, deer, and fish, and crabs uh, year-round. But every once in a while, nothing can really take the place of chicken wing. Uh, except for possibly these hog wings. Quite good. So uh, they're, they're part-cooked in, in, like, very highly seasoned water with, like, a lot of bay leaves and just salt. Until they're just about tender, but a little bit of chew left on them. And then... Uh, a very standard, uh, like little simple uh, flour dredge on them, and then fried, and then tossed in a in a sauce. It's essentially a hot wing sauce. So, but it, it's a fun little experience. You get the bone, you get the meat. It's crispy. It's a little chewy. All those things. So, a fun recipe though. But you know, just really trying to branch out with with new methods of cutting pigs, new wet methods of approaching cooking them. And, and just make it fun and, again, just approachable. You know, I think it's always best to put uh, game, especially if you're trying to convince people to eat it, in, in a context that they understand and they've eaten before. And they're like, oh, this is like this other thing. Or, oh, I didn't know I could make meatloaf with venison, things like that. Um, and, and, and just trying to, if you're, if you're trying to, to convince people to come over to, to your side and to start, start to utilize these resources a little more, it's the best way to do it. Nice. Right, so it sounds great. I like it. Thanks for going through the, the technique with us too. I think that, that, that should answer their questions. So the, the next one that, that caught our eye was the, the Torta Milanesa, which, uh, I mean, correct me, the, is Milanese like steak batter like that that's traditionally like italian uh, it can be you know yeah a milanese in in italian cookery would be a, a breaded cutlet or even a, a whole chop that's been pounded thin and then mm -hmm. fried um and then in mexican cooking a milanese is, is more of a, a thin meat cutlet uh and it's typically eaten on a sandwich like this and so the torta milanese is is a a sandwich it's like a you know a toasted roll it's got beans on it uh, and there's a lot of variations, you know, like we, we present, you know, the way that we like it. But of course there's, you know, there's, you can do all kinds of stuff. You could put cheese on it. You could put ham on it. You could put shredded iceberg lettuce on there. Uh, we go kind of just a real 
simple route where it's got a little puree of black bean uh, and avocado and pickled chilies and mayonnaise and you know just really and then a little a pound, a thinly pounded thin cutlet that's been fried and so I, I dedicate a whole chapter in this book to the like basically the power of the cutlet um, which of course you can do off of many, many game animals. Um, you know, like, like shot a turkey last night and, you know, the most exciting thing that I'm probably going to do out of that is make cutlets. You know, I also have a 10 year old daughter and if I pound bread and fry pretty much any, uh, land animal, um, she's going to eat that and love it. And so I, I think that cutlets are, 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 they're, they're, they're magic, you know, and so we dedicated a lot of space in this book to that and different preparations and techniques and making them and how to make them really good and, and how to efficiently do that. I always like to pound cutlets out and then wrap them up really well and then, and then vac seal the pounded cutlets and then freeze that because a lot of people will be like, oh, hey, well, do I just cut this whole piece and freeze it and then I come back later on? and slice it and pound that thin and then bread it. And my answer to that, and one of the, I think, unique aspects of this book is that we're also trying to, to convey efficiencies. And, and a, one way to better enjoy game meats and convince people to you know, utilize them more is to make it easier for them. And, and how to organize that, you know, coming from a kitchen mentality and that like have as much as you can possibly have done ahead of time. And so that on a Tuesday, you're pulling out these already pounded cutlets. And they're going to thaw because of the way you packaged them, which we'll, we show in the book. Uh, they're going to thaw in a matter of 10 minutes. And then you just have to bread them and pan fry them and you're, you're there. And so you're, you know, start to finish your 45 minutes in for dinner. And so I think it's really important to convey information like that also, which is another reason why we incorporate the cutlet in there in such, uh, with, with, with such focus, um, you know, and, and what different muscles that you can use to make cutlets. And then you know, there's four different recipes in there for a basically just a pounded, thin, breaded piece of lean meat that then you can then do all these other things with. And so the, you know, the torta just being one of those. Nice. Well, I I think it's great. It's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful sandwich. Uh, the the picture looks great, and I can't wait. Uh, when I get my copy of the book, when it when it uh, sends on that first round, I'm uh, add it to the top of my list of things to try. So, uh, Corey, I think you had a question. I see in the notes here. In the book, or do you focus on curing meat, making different, you know, cured meats, not just like sausages, but prosciutto or, or anything like that yes uh there is a curing chapter in there because i mean that's a that is one of the biggest questions that we face and then there's also the you just said it there's the very obvious that elephant in the room is the ham and so i mean without getting too verbose about it the the your iberico ham is likely the best cured ham in the world with apologies to italy <laughs> Because I just punked their, their prosciutto. <laughs> so the, the, the black-footed hog um, from the Spanish, the Iberian Peninsula, you know, uh, was, was the original hog that was brought over here in the 1500s. And so the progenitor of all the North American feral hog herd is an Iberico pig. And it just goes to say that you should be able to make a pretty amazing ham with these descendants of the same hog that is used to make the best ham in the world, or at least top two, okay? Um, and so uh, people ask about it a lot. So we did, we, I put a recipe in there for a country ham, which is essentially like a prosciutto or an Iberico ham that's been smoked. Um, there's a couple more ingredients in there. Sometimes there's a little bit of sugar, there'll be black pepper, uh, sometimes there'll be uh, uh, chili, dried chili, uh, and then there also can be curing salt, which we do put in there. Um, so we have a recipe in there for, for country ham, which is a, cure, a long time cured ham, uh, and then a, a, a copa, which is a, a shoulder muscle that's going to be quick cured and then dried. 
Um, and then and andouille, which is the super fatty, spreadable sausage um, made with a lot of fat, 50% fat. And then also a kind of Texas style, um, just here, it's just called sausage. It's just like a dried sausage. And they can be in any state of dryness from almost like soft to uh, jerky like. Uh, so there's a few curing recipes in there. And there's also a ton of sausage recipes um, and a lot of ground recipes as well. And I'd say a full third of the recipes are probably sausage uh, ground and curing because a large pig might only be good for sausage, things like that. So we went pretty heavy with that. So absolutely including some curing and safety and things like that. Yeah, it sounds awesome. Yeah. I, I'm I'm getting excited. The more we talk about it, the more excited I'm getting uh, ab- about this book. So what um, what's one of your favorites out of the the book? I know I'm not asking your your favorite uh, wild pig recipe, but out of the book, um, you know, there's the things that I kind of revisit a lot, like the paprikash. I really I really like a lot. It's just like a, a real simple stew. You can make it with any size pig. Um, we make our own paprika at the restaurant, so I'm kind of lucky in that I have access to this like really gorgeous dried ground chili uh, that's lightly smoked. And so um, it's essentially just this a stew. It's heavy on onions and paprika, and it's just a slow-cooked pig. Uh, and you can serve it with mashed potatoes or, or noodles or spetzel or, or anything like that. I really like that one. I revisit that a lot. Um, but for the most part, I mean, I eat a lot of sausage just because it's easy day in and day out. Um, there's a couple smoked sausage recipes in there. Um, there's a chorizo verde recipe in there that I really love. There's a Filipino longanisa recipe that's that's quite nice. It's got a lot of garlic, a bunch yeah. of sugar in it. Uh, it's kind of like sweet and garlicky. And that's kind of become my go-to for any kind of seafood boil. We eat a ton of crawfish and shrimp and blue crab um boiled you know from spring into summer and that's the sausage that i prefer to have in there because it's just like it's just it works so well it's like smoky spicy garlicky and sweet and if you're sitting there just you know getting dirty and crustaceans it's kind of that perfect like little break from that um so make a lot of that too um uh boudin make a lot of boudin with the livers uh, you know, to fry into balls, or there's a recipe in there. It's called su- Super Trashy Boudin Dip, and it's essentially just boudin and cream cheese that you put a- under the broiler. Um, and, you know, so <laughs> nice. There, there's a lot of recipes like that, too, that are like they don't take up a lot of space on the page. Uh, they've got like three ingredients, and they're real simple and approachable. So, I, I mean, I, you know, picking a favorite. I'm, I might not be able to do, but those are those are some that, that come to mind. I've become a fan of boudin. Yeah, it's good stuff. I love boudin. I mean, it, it, well, I mean, like one liver off of a hog also can produce so much boudin. I mean, not, I'm not saying you have to save every li- a liver off of every pig you shoot, but like even if you have like two pounds of liver, that might even make like a year's supply of boudin. I mean, I mean, obviously, if you're eating a lot of it, no, but. It makes so much once you add a little bit of fatty meat and some rice in there too. And that's something I love about it. It's just like the slightest bit of offal will really produce just a, a really manageable quality or a quantity of, of, of boudin. Um, and you, you really just don't need that much liver for it. And, and it's also a great way to eat the livers. You know, and that's, I mean, if you don't make it super spicy, it's, it's super kid friendly. Um, and you can, you can get a lot of people to eat uh hog livers if you make boudin yeah, it's a, a it's a good strategy uh big fan of it grew up eating it my mom would bring it in from louisiana and then when i went off to college down in new orleans it's just like you, you you travel outside of new orleans to get it but i mean you can find it in the city too but man that stuff boudin is so good well so we're our plan is we're, we're going to release this show before the book comes out it may be a week before the book comes out maybe a, a couple weeks before it comes out but um I guess the big question is: Should people should people pull the trigger as they're listening to this and and go buy the book or pre-order the book? I should should say, or should they wait? You know, wait the week or so, or you know, however long to to buy it and then have it sort of come out of the first print or so. Right. Well, once once we kind of clear that 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 
initial shortage in, in books that we have, we're going to be able to, to get everybody that did the Kickstarter, their book, in the first round. And then there'll be just a slight delay of a couple weeks until we're in books again. And from then on, it should be pretty readily available. Now, we're self-publishing this book, and so it is, it's not going to be available on Amazon. It's only for the time being, unless you're local to Austin, going to be available uh, through thehogbook.com, you know, through our website. And we're going, we're self-distributing and doing all that. Now, until that um, shows itself to be the worst idea ever, um, we're, we're going to continue with it. But uh, at the same time, we're kind of following this model of, of uh, um, leaving our Lord and Master Bezos out of it and, uh, and, and just trying to handle it all ourselves and, and, getting, and distributing it that way. Um, so yeah, I would, I would say go on and, and, and pre-order it. Uh, you know, we've got some cool merchandise too. We've got first light, uh, caps that have the bounding bore image on them and shirts and color prints and things like that. And, uh, yeah, just, just go on there. It's, it's pretty, it'll be pretty easy website to find. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and you pre-order it. Nice. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm excited to pre-order it. I, I'm going to motivate Colin and Corey to go pre-order it as well. So uh, uh, it'll be good. Happy to show support and happy to see the book come out. So we do have a couple questions. I told you uh, in the beginning we had some of our users, or some of our users, sorry, some of our listeners uh, engaged over on the community page that we have and, and when we told them you were coming on the show and, and they had some questions. So yeah, cool. uh, I'd like to hit you with a couple of those before we close out. Yeah. Um, so the first one being, um, what is your advice for the optimal timeline and process to age deer or similar animals? Okay. I like that. Um, I, I think the deer uh, age very well. Um, but also this is, this is a kind of a geographic question. You know, I, I'm in Texas and so I'm not hanging a deer in my garage for a month, you know, like you can in Wisconsin. Uh, so any kind of aging has to be done in some sort of, you know, facility or designated refrigerator. I'm lucky enough to have one of those, uh, in my home because it's a priority for me. Um, uh, but I, I'd say that optimally, you know, a deer or a, a similar, you know, an elk, moose, antelope, things like that, um, you know, I, I'd say at least uh, a week, you know, and up to three if you can have a really good uh, climate control and keep them, keep them very cold, uh, not some nice circulating air, and uh, they're just going to get better and better. I, uh, I aged a, uh, doe ham for about 36 days this spring in a refrigerator. Um, and it was amazing. You know, basically all the muscles that came off that back leg were pretty much of, uh, like backstrap or loin tenderness at the end of that, or even tenderloin tenderness. They were extremely tender. Um, the flavor was not super strong or anything like that. Uh, but you just you just got just a very nice um, like steak uh, cut off of any of those back muscles, which would ordinarily have a little bit more um, chew to them. Um, I don't think that be beyond you know the, your steaky type cuts or things you're going to cook medium rare or even serve raw uh, benefits much from dry aging. So if you're if you're more oriented towards a, you know a bunch of pounded cutlets and sausage and ground and things like that. It's not a necessity, but if you want to age, uh, then do so. And I'd say you need to keep it as, as close to freezing as possible. I'd say, you know, like 34 degrees ish, you know, you don't want to creep over 40 and have just nice, consistent cold with some good moving air, but not super dry. You don't want the outside to dry too quick. Um, and, and, age will will work wonders on deer even if it's not extreme you know even like a week or 10 days uh will really improve the experience nice um i think that yeah that answers that question pretty solidly i hope they enjoy that answer um so on on still the same so for 
for butchering pigs, do you typically, I mean, I know they're coming from, they're coming from the processor one, but do you hang, say if you're out hunting yourself, do you hang the pigs? Yeah. Well, I'll just approach this like, like if I, if I had shot a pig, you know, not because of, you know, our processor has a, sure. has a cold room that's, it's right above 32 degrees and he can hang them for two weeks and you hardly can tell. Um, yeah. So aging pigs, I, I don't think is something that is as important as, as important or do you get the benefits out of as much. Um, one thing that we discuss a lot in the book, and I don't know if this is uh, what the what the listener is going for, is just like how hogs are cooled after they are skinned and or gutted, or gutted and or skinned. Um, and this is one of the one of the things that I get kind of aggressive about and 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 argumentative about. And the common way of of cooling. Hogs and other and other game animals down here in Texas is to put them directly on ice, and I am adamantly opposed to that. Uh, I don't think that directly icing meats serves much purpose other than to make those meats soggy and to make them taste more gamey. Like the the prevailing mentality is that you would you know skin and gut a pig, you have some ice in the cooler, you put the pig down, you put more ice on top of it, you drain the, you open the drain plug on it, and this red liquid uh, flows out of the cooler and magically transports all the gamey flavors with it. And that's not really what's happening. Um, you're having a lot of uh, osmosis, and these, these muscles are really going to start to absorb a lot of that liquid from the ice, and it's going to be this gray, flabby mess. And as a butcher, I really hate cutting game meats that have been treated this way and i've done a lot of spec processing jobs where people will drop off a hog or a deer or or most tragically like once somebody brought me an axis deer that had been um ice soaked like this and the meat was gray throughout the t- the loin on the axis i don't know if you ever had axis but it is amazing it it's is pretty phenomenal yeah phenomenal meat um and it was heartbreaking to see this technique applied to that meat uh, and that it was just gray throughout. Um, it had been soaking in this ice water and it just, it was, it was worthless. It was not even sausage at that point. Um, and I, I just don't think it's a good method, uh, for cooling animals down. Although it, it is a good way to get them cold, but in my mind, what you need is to keep things dry. And so I advocate wrapping stuff up in unscented contractor or trash bags and then icing them uh, heavily in a cooler because you know we have hot temperatures it's very common for us to be hunting deer down here when it's 80 degrees and i'm sure you're in the same boat in florida Mm -hmm. Uh, you know deer and pigs you know we'll hunt pigs in the summer and you got to get them cold and i'm i absolutely understand that but i i feel like the key word here is dry and that's the only thing that 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 i contest in that whole situation is the, this this cold and wet versus cold and dry and i always say you would never go to the store and buy a aged wagyu ribeye take it out to your truck and stick it directly in ice to transport it on the way home because it's going to turn gray on the outside it's going to be dripping water you're not going to be able to sear it very well because as soon as that hits any kind of heat you're going to start to steam it on the outside you're going to interfere with your sear um, it's going to be harder to grill any cuts off of an animal that you've done that to. And then likewise, when you go to make sausage with meat that has soaked, uh, in ice, uh, it's going to exude a lot of liquid. And so in your sausage making process, you will, you'll, you'll grind and you'll mix and you will link. And then you put those links on a, on a tray to dry a little bit before they get smoked or packaged and you'll come back to them and you'll see all this liquid on the tray. And what that is, is that's water that it's coming back out, uh, of there. And so, um, I don't know if that pertains to the, the listener's question specifically to aging. Um, but I went there anyway. So I'm glad you hit on, I'm glad you hit on that. Cause it's like, that's, I've done the same. So some, uh, some butchering stuff, even for friends and, you know, uh, received meat in s- soaked ice water coolers, specifically wild pig. And it just, it, 
I mean, I'm going to process it for him because, you know, that's what friends do. But it just, I just, I, I told him, and I've tried to have so many conversations with him. I'm like, man, you, you got to approach this different. Like, you're you're killing the meat. And it's the same. It, he, he reads off the same scenario. Like, oh, well, it's, you know, it takes out the game flavor. It makes it, uh, it makes it more palatable. And I'm like, that's not, that's not, the, that's not, no. No. That's not what's happening. And I think that what we're really encountering here is almost psychological. And that we're washing it with the icy water, mm-hmm. right? and we and then there's that that red liquid that comes out of that drain plug. It's I don't know. It's the devil, you know. It's like it's like Satan literally leaving with all of his bad flavors. You know, he's coming out of the cooler, um, and that's what we're seeing because we are we are visual animals like that. We we see things like that, and we our our minds compute. That that's what's happening, and that's just not what's happening. Um, and like my way, you know, and I process a lot of pigs this way. You know, the pigs that that I and my friends shoot, we we wrap them, we keep the cavity down, we wrap them up tight in plastic, and we do everything that everybody else is doing, except that we have them wrapped, and then we ice them, and then we open that drain plug to keep water from cooling, and then. And this is to finally come around to the listener's actual question. When we come back to process those, preferably two, at least one day later, but preferably two to eight days, kind of like a little window in there where we can start cutting that hog. Um, They're going to be more dry to the touch. They're going to be super cold. And then when you get them out, you pull them out of the cooler and you pull that bag off of them and you get them on the cutting board, there's not water everywhere. And you're sitting there and you're cutting something that's, I'm not going to say it's bone dry, but it's drier. There's going to be some condensation and stuff happening, but it's like, it's not soaked. And it's much easier to deal with on the board. And ironically, what you're saying is that you're cutting for your friends. They're not having to deal with that floppy, flabby meat on the cutting board, which is, it's, it's kind of a nightmare to deal with. Um, And if once you start dealing with meat that's been kept dry in any way that you can, uh, I think you'll totally be sold on that method. And most people don't have walk-in coolers. That's obviously the best way. It's just to hang it in a, in a cooler with you know circulating air at 38 degrees or 36 degrees. It's going to be perfect. Um, but barring that, just a cheap igloo cooler um, uh, will we'll get you there. And so the time frame, I say, after shooting the hog, I like to at least give them a, a, a day uh, to go through rigor mortis. Now, uh, I understand how life works and sometimes you got to work or, or this or that. And like you have a window and it's like, I got to cut this pig up and start processing it into, into chops and sausage and so forth. And so maybe that has to happen 24 hours later and that's fine. Um, I'd say that, it, you know, if I had an optimal situation where I've got a dead pig and I've got that thing covered in ice and it's just chilling, um, you know, Two, three, four, five days later, uh, I'm going to pull that out and start breaking that down into cuts. Uh, I'm going to break my cuts and get those vac sealed and, and frozen. And then I'm going to get uh, packages of trim to be made into sausage at a later date, weighed out. Um, and then those will be frozen in packages. I typically use gallon bags for those. Uh, and then I can come back to sausage at a later date or I can batch sausages. I'll be like, okay, on this date, I'm going to make breakfast sausage. And then a week later, I'm going to make Italian sausage. And then a week later, I'm going to make smoked sausage. And so then I'm just pulling these packages of pre-weighed, uh, trim out of the freezer at a different date. I usually don't make sausage on the same day that I'm butchering chops, ribs, shanks, and so forth no matter what animal I'm, I'm breaking down, just try to divide that labor up a little bit. But, uh, long story, long story, not short. The, uh, <laughs> the optimal, uh, time is once it's past rigor mortis, uh, up until I'd say eight, maybe 10 days. Uh, if it's kept super cold, uh, that, that you'll be able to safely, uh, break a hog down into cuts for consumption or freezing. Hot Perfect. tip for the for the ice thing. Instead of using ice in my cooler, I freeze um, water bottles, mm-hmm. like your uh, half liter water bottles, mm-hmm. so you don't have all that free yeah. flowing water. Yeah, and and I wrap in and plastic yeah. as well. So yeah, that's great. Yeah, I like that a lot. 
So you had mentioned that uh, you got a turkey this week, and um, you you have you've gone crappy fishing and you had that sort of short season. So I just want to know what's all in your freezer right now because there's there's a lot of different wild game species down in Texas. I mm-hmm. just want to know the variety that you have in your freezer right now. Yeah, right now it's uh, well, it just just went in today was that turkey that first hopefully of four. Uh, that I'm going to put in there. I've got another trip coming up uh, that I totally anticipate filling the rest of those tags. Uh, So yeah, a little bit of turkey, uh, a bit of hog, a whole lot of venison. Um, I'm lucky enough to be able to shoot a lot of deer. Uh, I manage an uh, MLD property, which is a managed lands deer property, which is issued. um, uh, We got 66 deer tags this year. And so I was actively harvesting does down there so a lot of venison i eat a lot of of deer which is great (laughs) uh and a lot of crappie and a lot of white bass uh because that was the season that just kind of passed uh so i i I don't think there's anything in my freezer that's not those one two three four five things uh maybe get into a javelina uh, in a couple weeks uh and then from then on, there'll be some sporadic fishing uh, throughout the summer and then a whole lot of crabbing. Uh, if we can make it down to the coast, we'll probably take two or three trips down to the coast, and those are primarily for uh, blue crab, which is my other favorite thing. Man, I, I love blue crab. It's <sighs> a, You know, we, we have them down here in the Florida Keys. Mm-hmm. But people don't eat them commonly. Uh, really? Uh, they prefer, like, the stone crab and stuff. But oh, yeah. I, yeah. I tell you, every person I talk to, I'm like, you're missing out. Like, blue crab is where it's at. I argue with my daughter all the time. She's team stone crab. I'm team blue crab. You know, I I think a blue crab is one of the best it's, things I mean, in the world. I mean, I'm not one to turn down either. Yeah. No, no yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, we we're splitting hairs <laughs> there. But. When I moved down to Florida and I was asking people about blue crab, because I would see them snorkeling around and stuff, and people were like, oh, yeah, we don't really eat those. You know, we always go after snow crab. Hmm. Or, not snow crab, stone crab. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're great and prolific. You know, there's tons of them easy to catch um yeah I, and, you know, a good old crab boil and then you know sit there and pick the leftover meat and then crab dip crab cakes crab spaghetti for days after that that's oh i look dump, forward to that dump a whole bunch of old bay on them yeah yeah <laughs> um all right well uh so obviously we want people to go pre-order or buy the book depending on the timing in which they're listening to this podcast but uh What's what's uh, some cool ways they can connect with you, uh, maybe on social media or, or anywhere like that? Yeah, I'm on I'm on Instagram. Uh, Sakale is my Instagram handle. That's s a c dot a dot l a i t, uh, and that's that's my only uh, social media presence. I'm not on Facebook, or Twitter. Uh, the restaurant is just at diedue uh, I'm sorry at at Daidue on Instagram, it's D A I D U E, and then the other business is the New School of Traditional Cookery. It's also on Instagram, and then the Hog Book also has an Instagram page that I should probably update a little more than I do. Uh, but yeah, it's it's it seems to be pretty much an Instagram party around here. Nice, it works though. It's a great uh, uh, visual visual appeal. So all right, well. Um... So we sort of give at the end of our show uh, opportunity for any misfires, alibis, last thoughts. So um, being you're the guest today, do you, do you have a last thought you'd like to share with us or with the listeners out there? No, it's it's. I, I will say that it's it's pretty cool to have a conversation and four people from all over this country. That's pretty. Uh, that was really interesting. Uh, Oregon, Pennsylvania, and Florida and Texas all happening here. Um, that's just fun, you know, kind of those different perspectives, but it seems like almost everybody's agreed on blue crab. So, yep. (laughs) Agreed. (laughs) All right. Well, uh, Colin, you got last thoughts for us? Uh, none other than just thanks to Jesse for coming out and and being on the podcast. Uh, You bet. Great conversation. Uh, yeah, I was really, really like getting into the philosophical thinking behind feral hogs, especially what my main questions were about, Uh, about the latitude is about and uh, you know, I appreciate all your input and all your comments and oh. looking forward to seeing what comes out next time I, 
coming through Austin, though, I'm definitely going to have to. Oh, yeah. Please do. Show. Please do. Been on, been on my radar for a while. So. Cool. All right. Corey, last thoughts for you. Well, my question about his freezer was, was uh, my last question. But just thank you again, Jesse, for coming on. I wish, you know, I had more access to wild hogs. There's not too many here in Pennsylvania, but maybe I'll have to make a trip down south to yeah. shoot a couple and try some of those recipes out of the book. You bet. Well, I just want to say uh, definitely like the, the others echo. Thanks for coming on, and, and I'm glad we finally got a chance to sync up and chat. Um, I, I really appreciated it. And, a lot of the conversation about wild pig, you know, growing up and seeing the the, the mass population of it, and, and I, I would, as I mentioned earlier, like to continue to see it to be a very viable food source. So, uh, you know, I think the work that you're doing um, through all the different avenues that you're doing it, you know, film and writing and you know instagram all those things like it, it's it's doing great things out there and it's bringing a lot of awareness to to folks that, that we have yeah. a route and we should be having conversations and thinking about how how we can get down that route so well thank you that's uh, very kind thanks, thank you thanks for doing that for for spawning the conversation so um but era uh, Make sure you, you go pre-order it, the book. It's, uh, if you have the ability to do some wild wild hog cooking and uh, you know tune up that part of your, your culinary expertise. And uh, outside of that, you know, go visit social media, all the ones different, uh, the one Jesse mentioned there. And then once you're done there, go check out, make sure you're following our page over at Harvest in Nature so you can stay on top of all the things that we're doing there. And uh, whatever podcast platform you're listening to, punch that five-star button, leave us a review, tell us what we're doing wrong, or, you know, tell us what we're doing right. We love to hear that, too. So uh, thanks, everybody, and have a good night.